Okay, I think we can get started. Um, uh, thank you very much, Steve uh, uh, Gaguilo, for coming to uh, um, and, and accepting to talk to us today. The topic of your um, discussion is going to be pivoting from a consulting startup to uh, a software startup, which is very uh, um, much aligned with what we do in this class. Um, I'll say a few words about uh, Steve. Um, Steve is a uh, um, graduated from Penn State in 2009, and um, is the founder of an organization known as Cativate. Um, the website is given on the startup website of the university. And as the founder of um, Cativate, he leads a team that empowers change makers inside many different types of organizations. And his team at Cativate also created an enterprise software platform that supports workplace communities. He is also the author of a bestseller known as Search, your guide to put any idea into action. Uh, uh, Steve has worked on uh, many social ventures globally. And in 2014, he completed the Mongo Rally, which is a 10,000 mile adventure, adventure from London, London to um, Ulan Bato in Mongolia, uh, fundraising for the African Prisons Project. And uh, uh, amazingly, he has visited each of the 48 contigu contiguous United States uh, uh, states and is a member of the Century Club, having visited over 100 countries. And uh, he also established the Steve D. Gavillo Nintani Valley Society Endowment for Penn State's uh, history, which funded the development of a course about Penn State University history, which is um, um, a very important undertaking. Uh, so I'll now allow um, Steve to get on with his um, um, uh, lecture. Uh, so the AI is all you, Steve. Excellent. Thank you so much, Professor. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to another edition of Zoom School. Excited to have the chance to chat with you a little bit this morning about our startup, how we think about startups. And uh, we're going to keep it as discussion oriented as possible. So there'll be a few times that I ask you to go in and pop your questions into Q&A, and I'll monitor that. But throughout, if you have something that you want to ask, just ask. It's the opportunity uh, it's the best case scenario, right? You're not on camera. You don't have to ask it um, with voice. So you can just chat it in and, and we'll have a chance to, to have some conversation about it. So um, as, uh, as our you know, great introduction shared today, we're gonna talk a little bit about going from a consulting startup to a software startup. And I wanted to basically start by talking about the category that we're in and just helping define that a little bit for you. So essentially cultivate uh, is a company that supports and measures communities of change makers inside large companies. So we help build and measure communities of change makers. So those are two very loaded words, communities and change makers. And I thought, why don't we start by actually just helping define those a little bit and talk about those a little bit. So I'm gonna share my screen here. This is, uh, this is the Cultivate team. Uh, we have a number of Penn Staters on the team. One of my co-founders may be joining us here in a bit uh, named Zach Zimbler, who's also a Penn State um, IST grad. He's a head of engineering, head of our um, head of this product. So but I, like I said, I wanted to start by, by talking about these two loaded words, community and change makers. So one of my favorite quotes, Helen Keller alone, we can do so little together, we can do so much. I'm curious, before I define community, I'd like you to go into Q&A and just share with me a little bit, what communities are you part of? And this could be any type of community. I'm not giving you a ton of specific direction at this point in time. So any way that you wanna take that, I'm curious what you would say is, what are communities that you're currently a part of? Yes, Ethan, your microphones are gonna be disabled for this, but you can just go ahead and pop into here. So great, the Penn State community, IEEE is a community, like a certifying body as a community, yeah. The IST community, so something a little bit more specific than the broader Penn State community, the IST community, what else? I 
It doesn't have to be through professional associations either or through your school associations. It can be any community that you consider yourself a part of. Or even if you're like, I'm not sure if this is a community, then like, hey, throw it in. We can talk about it. Community at the apartment, right? So there's another kind of uh, geography oriented community, but like community of people that you live with or live near. Obviously, there's been a lot of um, buzz about uh, next door. I don't know if any of you follow the best of next door account on Twitter, but there's a lot of great stuff there. People in local communities, uh, women in engineering. Absolutely. So there's, there's a lot of different types of communities that you might be a part of. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about why people join communities. Obviously, they join communities for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, people join communities for social reasons, right? Because they want to be connected with other people who have similar interests. People join them for values-based reasons. They want to be connected with people who share similar values to them and have similar desires. People join communities for cultural reasons. Um, I want to be around people who have a similar background, a similar ethos, approach, similar story. Um, but people also join uh, for, for business reasons, right? And developing relationships in, in the same industry or similar industries. There's obviously a, a lot of different reasons why people join communities, but ultimately they join for a sense of belonging, right? In any of those circumstances, people are joining community for that sense of belonging. And so really a community, but my definition would be of this loaded word, is a group of people engaged around a shared interest. But what makes some communities more powerful than others is really how dynamic they are, is basically how committed people are. So I'll give a couple examples. Um, if, if you think about uh, a lot of online groups you might be in, right, of Facebook groups or LinkedIn groups or things like this, they may be fairly passive communities. Right, of people not being super involved. People say that it's a community, but at the end of the day, it's more like a distribution list or more like a one-to-many connections than the actual kind of node-to-node -node connections of a community. And so a lot of communities kind of fail to get to the level of being this dynamic community. And I'll give you a couple examples of what I mean by that. So uh, if you think about people who just like comic books, that's like, hey, that's kind of a passive community of people who are comic book fans. But the people who go to Comic Con every year and they dress up and they, you know, whatever costumes they decide to wear, like that's clearly a much more dynamic, engaged community of people who are super passionate about comics and how it changes their life and all this kind of stuff, right? Or if you're simply left handed, like, hey, I'm part of the left handed community and maybe we have some of you online who are left handed. But if you're part of the left-handed support group where you help each other to find the right kind of scissors and you help each other to seat your family at the Thanksgiving dinner table and you do different things like that, then that's definitely much more of a dynamic thriving community. So I wanted to define then a dynamic community as a group of people engaged around a shared interest who are moving in a strategic direction. And I think that's the real key for uh, communities to be dynamic and to be much more successful is that they're moving in that strategic direction. And a lot of those communities that aren't so engaging, this is the piece that they're missing. So I wanted to ask another question, which would be, what would be some of the things that you think make communities dynamic? So I talked about an example, you know, of, of Comic-Con. I talked about an example of the left-handed support group, but like what might be other things you can just pop back into the chat or pop back into the Q&A. Uh, what might be some of the other things that make communities dynamic? Community meetings, yeah, so touch points, interactions, socialization, the opportunity to meet with each other, learn from each other, absolutely. An interest in collaboration and team building. Thanks, Nick, uh, absolutely. So the desire of like, you know, if you're just seated there not really doing anything versus if you're actually trying to collaborate on something, trying to achieve something. So this is great, yes. There are a lot of these types of things are what make communities dynamic. So what's interesting is that dynamic communities are quite difficult to build as you can imagine, and especially so inside our workplaces. And this is where our focus is at Cultivate, which is really focused on doing this inside our workplaces. So I want to talk a little bit about how we think about community inside our workplaces, 
Um, and I think first it makes sense to start with just the most uh, basic way that we think about community at work, which is really the people we work with, right? Because we have a lot of different communities that we might participate in at work, um, but really maybe the first community we think of is the people we work with most closely on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it's interesting when we study work and we study workplace trends and, and how work is evolving, especially so, you know, how much it's evolved in the last year. Um, it's interesting to see the evolution and the journey of how we think about our workplaces. It used to be for many, many years that our primary community at work was the people that we have cubicles next to, essentially, right? It used to be pretty much like the show The Office, that like that was our community, right? That like we knew we would see Dwight and you would see Pam and like that was gonna be your workplace community was that the people that you happen to work near, that was really your default community. But what's interesting is that over the course of the last maybe 10, 12 years, uh, especially in large organizations, we've seen much more of a distributed workforce, right? Where it's, oh, I'm working with people in China, I'm working with people in Brazil, I'm working with people in Australia and South Africa, or wherever it is. And so your default community might be the people who you're on the same team with, but they're actually located in a lot of different places. And that's the group that you're, you know, constantly in meetings with and collaborating with and emailing with and texting with and whatever. Um, and then now, of course, uh, especially in the last year, you're going from a distributed work environment where people are working in different offices to a distributed environment where people are working exclusively from home, no matter where you are. Uh, and it's actually given people a lot of freedom to basically decide who do they want their workplace community to be. Right back in the you know old days, if you had an office next to such and such person and you didn't like that person, too bad, you still had to see that person pretty frequently throughout the day. But now you can really decide how you want to work, who you want to work with, who you want that workplace community um, to, to be. And what's interesting is we've seen a lot of um, virtual communities spin up to support that idea. And so, for example, there's a clubhouse club of these people who don't talk. It's called virtual, um, virtual co-working. And what people do is they log into this clubhouse space. So they're connected, but they don't actually say anything. They're just working. They, they're like socially anxious people who want to feel like they're working with other people. Um, and just knowing somebody else is on the line, like helps them. And so at the top of every hour, somebody will check in and be like, hey, how's everybody doing? How's it going? Cool? Good. All right, back to work for another hour. And they're all in there and they're all connected, but they're able to kind of do that work virtually, which is fascinating. Of course, there's also like this whale moan room where people just go in and moan like whales for hours. I don't quite understand that, but like, hey, it's a thing. Um, but what's interesting is we see a lot of these different types of, of trends. Uh, this is also what's fueled a lot of the interest in Miami recently. So Miami's mayor is trying to recruit a lot of tech talent and a lot of talent to move to his city. So now with this idea that you can work anywhere, you can also choose well, what geographies do I wanna be in for when I'm not working and what that looks like and kind of my ability to be connected to people. Um, and then we're also seeing this rise of what I would call internal influencers at work. Um, and so this is an example of uh, two people who's, who just started, this I actually just started three weeks ago and they already have a following of 241 people inside their company, uh, but they started this, this vlog series, uh, kind of an antiquated term for essentially a video series where they're sharing, here's what we're up to and here's the kind of stuff that we're doing. And so we're seeing the rise with, with tools like Stream and Teams and Yammer and these kinds of things that are become more pervasive in our workplaces. We've seen the rise of the internal influencer in taking you know, what we know as common to be on Instagram and TikTok and in places where people are you know, influencers of people en masse, um, that those same concepts are being applied in the workplace and people are building communities around them regardless of their level in the organization, regardless of their authority in the organization, regardless of their title. Um, people have the opportunity to build a following that can actually be much more powerful than their title and allow them to exert a lot more influence in shaping the direction of the organization. So these are some of the interesting trends that, that underlie our work in how we think about communities and the kind of stuff that we see around communities. 
So as I mentioned, Cultivate uh, supports building and measuring communities of change makers inside big organizations. So, so there's some context around community. I wanted to talk next about change makers. So if we pop back into the Q&A, um, let's just talk about, so what's a change maker? And uh, you can just give me your answer. Again, these are loaded words. They're what Marvin Minsky would call suitcase words, words that pack a lot of meaning. We all have kind of our own baggage around them. Everybody has a slightly different meaning and that's okay. Uh, but I'm curious, when you hear the word change maker, what does that mean for you? Just pop into Q&A. Something or someone that causes change. Thank you, anonymous attendee, for the quite literal yet accurate absolutely answer. So some something or someone that causes change. Thank you. What else? Yeah, somebody wants to make something better. Okay, thank you. So I, I want to share a, a story that I think helps illustrate what I what I mean when I talk about change makers, particularly in a in a workplace context, and, and then share a little bit of um, my story as well, kind of how we got here, uh, and then I'll get into the more kind of direct on the nose presentation right around how we started this consulting company that became a became a software company. So. I want to imagine, I want you, you to imagine for a second that you're a custodial worker uh, and that you're going about your work and trying not to get in anybody's way and just kind of doing your, um, doing your job. This described Richard Montanez, um, who is a custodial worker at Frito-Lay. And one day as he's you know, going about his business, uh, the Cheetos manufacturing line broke down. So this is a very sad day for many people um, that the Cheetos throughput you know, had to stop. And so a bunch of people are running over to the machine, seeing what's going on. Richard runs over and sees what's going on. It turned out it was, it was gonna be a pretty big fix. Uh, it was gonna take the rest of the day and then we're gonna have to discard all the Cheetos that had gone through. And you know, this made Richard very sad, but also quite interested in saying, hey, what are you gonna do with, uh, with those Cheetos you're gonna throw away? And if you're gonna throw them away, can I just take some home? And they were like, sure especially because these were plain Cheetos. They had not yet been dusted with the orange coating that makes them Cheetos. Uh, and when Richard got home with some of these plain Cheetos, he quickly realized why they were planning to throw them away is because they really don't taste very good like this without that orange dusting on them. And so Richard kind of looked around the house and thought, well, what, what might I have that could make these taste a little bit better? Uh, and Richard had some chili powder at home. So he put some chili powder on these plain Cheetos and he's like, hey, these actually taste pretty good. Um, and so he shared some with his kids that they liked them, his neighbors. And he's like, you know, I think we might have something here. Um, but imagine all the barriers that might stand in the way of a custodial worker at a large multinational organization being able to actually kind of pitch this idea or bring it forward to someone in the company who could actually make it happen. Uh, and so there was a lot of doubt in Richard and thinking like, do I actually want to share this idea? Do I want to pursue this idea? But he remembered that at some point in time, um, it might have been like three years before this happened, the then president of Frito-Lay had shared this mantra with everybody there. It said, act like an owner. And so Richard thought, you know what? I'm going to take him up on that. I'm going to at least try. So he comes in his next day in his best suit and his best tie. Um, and he marches up to the office of the president of the company, somehow convinces the admin to get five minutes of time. Uh, and he goes in and he pitches this idea. And he's like, here's the deal. Cheetos, chili powder, tastes great. I brought some here, taste it. What do you think? And they end up having this conversation. From that, not only have they since launched Flamin' Hot Cheetos, but Flamin' Hot Cheetos is the number one selling snack product in Frito-Lay's uh, $21 billion annual snack portfolio. So it leads their snack portfolio. They've now, this is so popular that they've licensed this brand out to make Flamin' Hot Cheetos mac and cheese, other types of products. And Richard has gone from being a custodial worker at Frito-Lay to being a commercial vice president at the company who helps shape company strategy, who also works on their uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy. Uh, and so it's a, it's a pretty remarkable story of someone who decided that he wanted to make change inside a company. And so when I think about change makers, 
uh, inside companies and building communities of change makers, I'm often thinking about the types of people like Richard uh, and how we help empower more people to be able to have stories like Richard and to come together um, and be able to make change inside their organizations. So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, my career journey and how it led to, uh, to this company focused on communities of change makers. So after I graduated from Penn State IST, um, as many of you know, if you are Penn State IST students, you're, you know, relatively, I wouldn't say bombarded, because that's not a super friendly word, but uh, recruiters are very present in your life, right? There are multiple days per year um, where you have the uh, hallways of the IST building in, you know, in the before times, in normal times, I'm sure there have been virtual events this year. Um, but in the before times, there are normal, you know, days throughout the year where you have these companies just lining the halls talking about how they recruit ISD students and what that means and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I, th that was very much my uh, experience and very much my path and how I ended up um, after school at Johnson & Johnson. And so I, I come into Johnson & Johnson um, in their IT leadership development program, which again, I know they recruit for now and a lot of companies recruit for their IT development programs. Uh, and to me, the decision on that was, hey, I want to join a company where I, you know, I'm, I'm, I was passionate about healthcare, passionate about emerging markets during my time at Penn State. I was involved in the humanitarian engineering and the uh, engineering leadership development programs uh, that sent me to India for a summer and working on projects in Kenya and Morocco. And so this was the kind of work I wanted to do. So I thought, okay, J&J &J is the kind of place where I can go do that work. And so I went in with this kind of desire to be a change maker. And to a certain degree, I was able to have some success. I was able to get a role in uh, emerging markets. I lived in Switzerland for a few years, uh, getting to focus on really the uh, market appropriate products for uh, Middle East, Eastern Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa. One of the cool things we were able to do is, um, you know, unfortunately, if you think about a, a, a Coca-Cola, uh, they call it the world kind of unifying beverage, right? Everybody in the world drinks Coca-Cola, whether you're living in a, a slum somewhere or you're the president of the United States, you drink Coca-Cola. Um, so unfortunately, there's a bottle of Coke within arm's reach of every person on the planet. But if you think about a crate of glass bottles of Coca-Cola and, and really the way they come up at the neck, you have wasted space in that crate. So we actually designed these pods that slotted in between the Coke crates in which we could put oral rehydration salts, tampon, shampoo, basic consumer healthcare products, piggyback off Coke supply chain and get them out into those communities. Uh, and so that was an example of like, hey, being able to you know, mobilize a large organization to do something really interesting. And again, kind of act as a change maker. But I found as I wanted to continue to pursue these ideas in a massive company of 140,000 people, uh, it could be quite challenging because there would be a lot of people who would say, well, we can't do this for this way. And, you know, here's 8 million reasons why and blah, 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 blah. And so um, one of the things that I started doing in that environment, uh, which is what really attracted me to this category of building communities for change makers, is that I started building a community of change makers. So I started looking around J&J &J for who are the people who have been capable of challenging the status quo? Who have been the people who've been able to really advance new ideas uh, and make things happen? And I started bringing that group together. Uh, I actually started bringing that group together under the auspices of, uh, of TEDx and started organizing these TEDx events in the company that was selfishly putting people on the stage that I had seen had made new ideas happen. It was trying to make that more of a norm and make that more of a reality and saying, hey, we can make new ideas happen here. And so for the period of a few years, um, that actually became my job uh, where I was focused on empowering people and, and working to develop people's leadership skills around how they advance ideas. Uh, and we organized different events and programs around the world. And, and one of my favorite uh, change maker stories was the story of this woman named Magda Shanai. So Magda was a, an economist uh, at J&J &J, working on a product that we called uh, esketamine. So it was basically a nasal delivery of the drug ketamine as an antidepressant. Uh, and so Magda was very passionate about uh, the challenges of depression and something that had affected her and her family. And she really wanted to work to address it. 
And so in addition to just working on a, a pharmaceutical intervention to depression, Magda was actually also passionate about thinking about how do we diagnose depression and how might we change that? Because over the course of the last 30 years, nothing has changed about how depression gets diagnosed in, in Western countries. Uh, we essentially use something called the MADRIS scale, which is a, a series of questions that a clinician asks a patient. And so it's self-report, right, of, you know, do this, do this, blah, 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 blah. And so it's self-report diagnosis. And Magda actually had an idea that through video gameplay, you can make a much more efficacious diagnosis. You can be much more accurate where people are more unconsciously making decisions versus consciously answering questions. But imagine the meeting, again, a little bit similar to Richard as this kind of custodial worker trying to pitch this product. Imagine the meeting where you have a, you know, more of a low level economist in the company pitching this idea that, that a pharmaceutical med device and consumer healthcare giant should be making a video game. Uh, as you can imagine, it didn't really go very far. But the point of having our community of change makers was that we could give Mag the visibility and the opportunity to say, this is an idea I wanna make happen. And from that, she started to build her own community, her own kind of skunk works team of, cool, you're gonna be my clinical person, you're gonna be my uh, game developer, and you're gonna be my comms person, whatever it is, and kind of built this skunk works team that got the first ever video game through clinical trials um, and actually led to J&J &J partnering with Microsoft and launching this game avatar that is now actually helping patients and helping with how we think about uh, mental health diagnosis. So there can be a lot of impact when we empower change makers inside big companies through communities to be able to, to make change happen. Uh, I often think of it as going from being this kind of lone pirate ship in terms of a lot of people like Magda's and like the Richards of the world, they can join really big companies and they can feel like they're this lone pirate ship trying to make an impact. And it can be quite hard sailing out there all by yourself. Um, but connecting them helps turn them into this armada, right? And helps turn them into this fleet of pirate ships that's able to really make a difference and make a change uh, and work to affect the status quo of the organization. So I'll give you a couple more examples of workplace communities. Uh, and then I'll talk about kind of what we do specifically, and then we're going to open it up to, uh, to questions. So uh, an example, you know, because there's so many different types of communities, right? What I was just talking about were more like innovation related communities and idea related communities. Another type of popular community are what, what a lot of companies call employee resource groups, ERGs, or, or different companies call them communities of belonging, or there's a lot of different names of them, affinity groups. Uh, GitHub, uh, their communities of belonging uh, have been really popular. It's been baked into their DNA since they started the organization. And obviously GitHub has done really well and they were acquired and um, you know they, they have a really great success story. Um, but one of their most popular communities of belonging is called Black to Cats. And what they're focused on is really around recruitment, retention um, of their black employee population, as well as making, as well as setting goals in the organization about you know, the number of executive seats that are available to black employees and working to really advance that group's needs. And so what's different I think about black to cats versus sometimes a lot of ERGs is again, they might be communities um, based on a shared interest if the ERG just gets together and has events and they have speakers and they have that kind of stuff. But moving in a strategic direction means they have goals, they have objectives, they have things they're trying to change, they have things they're trying to affect in the organization. And so this is a good example of that, that they do have that strategic direction and they are working to do that. Uh, another example is at, at Intuit, they have what they call their D for D catalyst, their design for delight catalysts. And so this is a group of people that get certified and trained uh, in being able to bring this D for D approach, which is kind of Scott Cook's secret sauce, the founder of Intuit. Um, they, they're able to bring this, this D for D approach to their projects. And so again, they're not just a community of interest of, oh, people who like this process or who think about this process or whatever, but they're a community of practitioners who are actively advocating for and really evangelizing people around the organization to use this process and to use this kind of approach um, as, they, as they do their work. And so at Cultivate, like I said, our whole mission, our whole remit is to build and measure communities of change makers inside large organizations. And so 
when we started four years ago, a lot of our work um, looked more like this, right? We do strategy work. Um, so helping bring together the right people and figure out what is it that we want to accomplish? How do we get it done? We do a lot of learning work that's focused on the deployment of learning programs. So essentially training programs, development experiences for people to learn how to advance their ideas, how to communicate their ideas, you know, how to be able to effectively, um, uh, you know, just have the necessary skills to be successful. And then we do a lot of community work as well that's focused on helping people. How do you even think about community? What, what, what makes sense as a community strategy? We actually have a community accelerator that we run a couple of times a year that brings together people who are designing workplace communities and lets them interact and learn from each other. So we do a lot of you know, focus on community building. But what's fascinating is you know, in that first three years of really doing this consulting work and doing this professional services work, we got to learn a ton about that customer population. We got to really understand their needs really well and understand that from a community perspective, there's a big gap of tools that help focus on measuring community success and how people actually understand how engaged people are in their community. Uh, right now, essentially the status quo for measuring these workplace communities uh, is a set of spreadsheets that people might have that say, oh, these people attended this event, or, you know, these people are on this email distribution list, or, you know, these are the people that just like, hey, from the back of my head, I know that they've been really involved, uh, but there hasn't been really an intelligent way of bringing all of that together. And so based on seeing that need again and again in our consulting work, uh, we saw that, hey, there's a real opportunity to build out a platform focused on this. Uh, and that's what led us to building out our platform called Unbury. And so the Unbury platform uh, is able to take all of those data together about people's workplace communities and help aggregate it in some really meaningful views. So we orient everything around what we call our engagement ladder. And so the engagement ladder essentially is taking that series of data about, you know, oh, th these people have been engaged this way on Teams or in your intranet space. These people have been engaged in these events, have been engaged through emails or internal podcasts or whatever those different opportunities to be engaged are. And so it basically takes all of that and it helps chart out for you where do your community members stand on this engagement ladder? Are they, you know, just curious where maybe they've attended one thing or participated in one thing, but they haven't quite taken the next step yet? Are they really engaged of people who've been engaged in multiple activities? Are they your advocates, right? Are people who's like, you know, these are the people that are gonna come to every community experience, they're gonna help, they're gonna lead, they're gonna help drive the strategy. Um, or are they people who've kind of fallen off that like once someday long ago were engaged, but aren't anymore? Or are they just too new to understand, right? And so the point of this uh, engagement ladder is that by bucketing people in this kind of way, we can also provide uh, intelligent recommendations for what steps you might take to move them up the ladder. And so our goal is to always be moving somebody one step up the ladder. Those inactive people, you just wanna get to curious. We just wanna get them to their first event. Those people who've done one thing, we just wanna get them to their next series of things. Those people who are pretty engaged, you, you wanna help, help them take that step up to becoming advocates, right? Um, and so this is helping provide recommendations for how to do this. This is helping uh, automate how to do this, automating recognition. Hey, you just came to your first event. Here's what to do next, right? Um, some of that type of stuff, as well as we're aggregating a lot of data from companies HRIS or their HR information system um, that's bringing in demographic data, what part of the company they work for. So we could see the community members on the map uh, we can drill in and look at community member profiles. Uh, we can actually store information like a CRM of like, ooh, Nancy's a big fan of chocolate, um, mint chocolate chip ice cream. I'm going to put that in her CRM profile or whatever it is, right? And so there's an opportunity for us to have all of this intelligence in one place as we think about, you know, building our workplace community. So really, that's the product that we're focused on. Um, and the, the couple of things I just wanted to call out from that of, I think, what led us to being able to have a successful software product from being a consulting company is that we know the needs of our customers really well. So one is I used to have that job myself, right? I talked about what I used to do. So like I have the insights of having been in that seat 
and also now have the insights of having worked with dozens of other people in those seats. So I know those customers really, really well. I know how to sell to those clients, right? So we've done it in professional services. We've been able to sell those strategy, learning, and community products from a consulting standpoint. And so that sets us up really well to be able to get into software um, and then building trust in the marketplace, right? Having this track record of client delivery. And so where we are right now as a company is that we're definitely like, if you think about the professional services side, the consulting side, and the software side, the professional services side of the company is still bigger, right? But what we are, what we plan to see, what we would likely see over time, is that while this grows, you'll see this growth, and you'll see the software growth at some point overtake that, um, because obviously the scalability and the business models that you can have around software products are just very different than the amount of um, you know human labor involved in being able to deliver on professional services. So really that's what I wanted to tee up today. I wanted to share a couple other things here as well that we do have what we call our cultivators community, which is a community that's open to the public of people who are interested in being change makers inside big companies. These are some examples of those companies. Uh, I'll share a link to that if you're interested in being part of a space where people have this kind of conversation, uh, we would welcome you to, to join us there. As well, we also have um, a, a free 10-day email course all about how do you show up more empowered at work and how do you build that community of change makers around you. So as some of you look to graduate and potentially take jobs inside large organizations, and if you feel like, hey, I kind of want to be like a Magda or like a Richard and being able to make this influence, um, then, then you might find you know, more stories like that, more examples, more models. How do you think about power? How do you think about you know, all the science behind that kind of work? Uh, that's all available to you as well. And I'll also share the link to that. So with that, uh, thank you for your participation in the presentation. And I want to open it up to allow for any questions that you might have. You can start by just, you know, putting them in q and I think they might get read out. Um, so yeah, what questions can, can I answer? Or as well, you know, Professor, if you have questions that you want me to answer or anything else, I'm, I'm happy to, to spend the time. I don't uh, have any specific questions at uh, the moment, but uh, I'd like to give uh, the attendees a chance to ask you questions. Just gonna grab those two links for you that I promised and get those dropped in. Yeah, what, what questions can I answer? Could could be directly related to the presentation or indirectly related. I know in this course, you're very focused on uh, user needs and user centricity and probably concepts like design thinking and all that. So if there's any aspect of that that I can um, share more about from my experience, I'm, I'm also happy to do. You might be in a place now where you're working on final projects or starting to think about final projects. So if there's anything I can ask that they could help you think about that, um, you know, I'm here for you. All right, well, I'm gonna drop these two links in for you. So as I promised, this is the community for people who are you know, interested in uh, you know, having a chance to be in a space with other people wanting to drive change. This is the Empowered Cultivator Lab, um, which is the sequence of, uh, you know, or you guys might not be able to see that, but I think if, uh, if the administrators can see it, you can send the links after. Um, yeah, if, I mean, if there's no questions, I'm, I'm happy to give time back, um, but you tell me how you want to use the time. I didn't have any uh, additional plans for um, today apart from your talk, so um, if there are no questions. I do see one question in here, which I'm happy yeah. to, to share. So it says, how has your time at PSU helped you professionally? So, um, yeah, I mean, I think in a bunch of ways, I would say as an IST student, I think one of the things IST does really well is prepare you with these 
projects and oftentimes projects for companies that are very much real life. So I will say that like when I started my career at J and J, as I mentioned, I felt really prepared to jump in right away because those types of projects I think were very consistent. So I think that was good. And then as I mentioned, you know, one of the other sets of programs I was in in the humanitarian engineering and social entrepreneurship programs in engineering and engineering leadership development work is, you know, that that really turned me on to the world of uh, just more social impact ventures um, and was able to clue me into using that as a compass for my career. Because what was interesting is, you know, when I when I came into Penn State, I was like the kid in high school who built computers and that kind of stuff. And so that's kind of what, what drew me to IST. And then I think, you know, a lot of those other programs at Penn State started to open up my kind of global perspective, because before I had been to Penn State, I think I'd been to like three states and no other countries and I just had a very limited worldview. And I think Penn State helped open up that for me and get me kind of moving around the world and working around the world. And then it was working on trying to selfishly advance my ideas for ways to do that, that I found this, you know, real passion I have around empowering others and bringing them together. Um, and then that's really what's fueled the last 10 years of my career uh, in doing that work. So thanks for the question. Uh, the links that you have sent, I'll share the links with my students in their class. So I, I, I've, 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 I've grabbed them and sent them somewhere. So uh, those students will be interested in following up these issues can, uh, of course, take advantage of that. I'll post them somewhere in my class. So that's not a problem. Um, a question, um, what uh, inspired you to want to travel all over the states and around the world? Uh, I think relentless pursuit of insights. So just trying to learn. I think yeah, I'm an insatiably curious person who wants to learn. And one of the best ways to do that is to obviously have the chance to experience different things and experience, you know, different places. So obviously the last year has been very different. It's fascinating because I got, went from a lifestyle of being on probably a hundred, uh, you know, flights a year to now not having been on a flight since March 1st, 2020. Yeah. Uh, and so it's just a very different pace and it's a very different way to try to pursue those insights. But yeah, for me, I think one was the desire. And then two was, I think the position of privilege of because of my work, and because I was, you know, actively trying to say, hey, we should try this, um, my work helped send me a lot of different places. So that was what, you know, gave me the opportunity to do that kind of stuff. I see one more question here. Could you talk about how you personally have learned to empathize with users in unique settings? Great question. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, this design thinking mindset is really at the center of any kind of problem solving. It's not just at the center of technical problem solving, although that maybe how we often think of it, right, is that, hey, if you want to design a web application or a, or a tool that yes, you need users at the center, but you need users at the center of everything. If I just wanted to design a better waiting experience at restaurants, you use user at the center, like, well, what are people thinking about and what are people focused on? And you kind of go from there, right? So how I have personally learned to do that, I think one is um, uh, not being afraid to just chase that curiosity. So I actually had a chance once to meet Robert Krolwich, who's uh, someone who I really look up to. He was one of the uh, co-host of Radio Lab. If you've ever listened to any of their old episodes, there was a lot of really good stuff there. Um, and I, asked, like, I, I consider him to be such a good interviewer. He asked really great, interesting questions. Um, and I asked him how, you know, how he came up with that. And he said, you have to believe in your curiosity and gently insist that it gets fed. <laughs> uh, and I really like that kind of positioning of just like feeding your curiosity, asking those questions, just kind of digging in. Like one, I'm genuinely interested in the answer. And two, of course, like really good empathy strategies is like when you get into the, the weird spaces and you get those kind of interesting, unique insights is where the good stuff comes from that you can design from. So I, I don't think you can ever design or solve a problem that you don't really understand. And so, you know, empathizing is oftentimes working with people who understand the problem well so that you can solve it. And I think that's why we've had success with cultivates because like it's a problem set we understand really well. It's a problem set that I've been immersed in for you know the better part of a decade now. So I'm excited to see how all of that continues. Let's see whether we have some few more questions. We still have plenty of time.
And I know, you know, people are participating in a bunch of stuff this week. So I think it's great that you're doing this startup week. My, my other recommendation would just be check out some other stuff. Don't go to just yes. the ones that are your class, right? I know you, you might be here because like, well, this is my class. It's on the calendar. I have to come. Like, yeah. take a peek at some other speakers. See, see what's up. You know, I think you, you might have the chance to get exposed to uh, some interesting stuff this week. So take advantage of it. Yeah, I agree with that. Yes, I looked at the program and there are lots of interesting things one might want to listen to. So, um, yeah, we still let's wait until maybe 10 o'clock. Yeah, I think maybe maybe we'll just call it if there's yeah. not a lot of other questions. I know, like I said, there's a lot of other things going on. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, okay, I agree. Um, uh, Steve, thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Um, I found your talk very inspiring and uh, um, very interesting. Um, uh, one of the things that we, I think we know is people don't like change and you are, uh, a catalyst of change and, and I think change is what makes things different, what takes us from where we are now to something better, hopefully. And um, I think the work you are doing is awesome. And I I hope some of the students will take you up and um, take up on your uh, the work you are doing. Maybe visit your website, cativateall.com and take a look around and maybe you have a way of being contacted on the website, correct? Absolutely, yep. Yeah, so um, I, uh, we, we are very grateful for you to come and share your journey and your ideas with us. And I think it was uh, worth every bit of uh, your time and our time. And uh, we thank you so much. So thank you. Uh, with that, I think we can call it a day for, for this session, I guess. Great. Thanks so much thank for the you. opportunity. Good luck, everybody. Good luck in your careers and, and what you have to do. And uh, thank you. You have a great day today. Thanks. Bye.